richest colored girl in the world couple colored what you talking about i don't know how to really start this uh, video so i'm just gonna go for it what do we know about sarah rector who is sarah rector supposedly sarah rector also known as sarah rector campbell and sarah campbell crawford born 1902 passed away in 1967 was a black citizen of the muskogee creek nation best known for being the richest colored girl in the world she was born in an all-black town of taft located in the eastern portion of oklahoma in what was then indian territory so an all-black town and indian territory you guys understand let's see what else wikipedia says okay it says <laughs> she had five siblings her parents Rose McQueen, huh? McQueen, that's a Highlander name. I'm gonna show you guys. And her husband, Joseph Rector, Rector, were the grandchildren of slaves owned by the Creek Indians before the Civil War. Oh, really? We're gonna see if that's correct and that's accurate or historical. And which became part of the Muscogee Creek Nation after the Treaty of 1866. As such, they and their descendants were listed as freedmen on the Dawes Roll. The Dawes Roll, huh? But which they were entitled to land allotments under the Treaty of 1866, made by the United States with the five civilized tribes, all right? So, yeah. All right, so this is uh, Sarah Rector's family tree I created. You know, I grabbed this information from public, uh, you know, sources. You know, all this is started out where her son was able to find his parents, Sarah and Kenneth, her husband, Kenneth Campbell, Sarah Rector right here, okay? gonna go into Sarah Rector real quick so we have Sarah Rector uh, parents Joseph Rector and Rose Jackson yeah she's a Jackson 1910 census got her listed here under Joe Rector and Rosie Rector the parents and her other siblings here I want to show you uh, her in the DOS row that's it says here Oklahoma and Indian Territory US DOS census cards for five civilized tribes this is the actual role right here as you guys can see Sarah Rector is right here. Got her listed name of father, Joseph Rector. Name of mother, Rose Rector. Now this role is not so bad. What I noticed with these uh, Dawes roles, a lot of them are very messy, very unorganized. A lot of them don't have correct information. Let me show you guys what I mean. Here we got a uh, uh, land allotment, All right? To Sarah Rector, represented by Joe Rector. Her father appears upon the role of a newborn citizen by Friedman of the Creek Nation, approved by the Secretary of Interior. Number 261 it says she is entitled to an allotment of the lands of the Creek Nation under the Act of Congress, approved March 3rd, 1905. So here is her application for the enrollment in the five civilized tribes. Sarah Rector, as you guys can see, Tribe Creek. Here she is at the age of three, Sarah Rector. It is a... Uh, Native American citizens and freedmen of five civilized tribes uh, census and role. All right, so now I'm going to go into her parents. So Joseph Rector and Rose Jackson. 
In the 1900 census, Joseph Rector is 20 years old, birthplace Indian Territory, Oklahoma, raised so-called black, father John Rector and Betty Rector, his mom, okay? What you guys are going to see turns out to be uh, John McQueen or Jack McQueen, Benjamin Rector. I'm going to explain all that, okay? Spare with me. And his mom, Emma Betty Jackson. We got another Jackson on this side. Again, Jackson, McQueen, they're coming from the same place. Now we're going to go to his dad, Jack or John McQueen, okay? I want you guys to see something. So here we had Jack, John McQueen, Benjamin <laughs> Rector. Why he got so many names, Curimeo? That's a good question. So here we got John uh, Rector so-called <laughs> and Betty wife son Joe and so on he's from the town of Canada or Canadian in Oklahoma now down here there's a little note it says John Rector on Dunroll as John McQueen he comes up as John McQueen okay so think about that we already knew we read Wikipedia said that she was descended from somebody named Benjamin McQueen so where does the rector come in? Guys, actually, that name came out of nowhere. Seems like there's an alias they took on. I'm going to show you that they even admit historically that it was an alias he took on. And so this is something common throughout these years done by a lot of people and for all kinds of different reasons. So when you're doing this genealogy thing, you got to pay attention to all these little things because you might go up a wrong line or you might not ever find the parents because you're thinking he's a rector. So you're looking for parents that are rector instead of McQueen, right? So just a side note right there. 1900, again, John Rector, he's 65. Birthplace, Indian Territory. Right here, we got an application for land allotment by John uh, Rector, you know, alias says, I do hereby make application to have set apart to me and to those who might lawfully represent land selected by me as follows. Okay, so he's like, give me this lot right here. So John, just to get a reference, John was born around 1835 or 1830s in Indian Territory. We're talking about, you know, a while back from now, we're talking about Civil War times, right? John Benjamin, all right, not any more rector. All of a sudden, he's Benjamin. How is he Benjamin? What happened to McQueen? Colored troops. Right here, he's under John Rector. It's a Civil War pension index. Indian Territory, Oklahoma, we're talking about him. Betty Benjamin, now she's the Benjamin. And that's his wife, we know that's Betty. Or again, Emma Betty Jackson. So what I'm trying to point out is that they go on by different names, but it's the same person. I had to put all this together. It was confusing at first, but now remember, he's not even a Rector. Or a Benjamin. He's a McQueen. It says here, find a grave. John Rector. Where's he buried at? Blackjack Cemetery. Death date, 1915. And you also got this one. Find a grave. Jack Benjamin Rector. Now he's Jack. What happened to John? Children, Joseph Rector. Yep, we're talking about the same person. Joseph is his son, right? The father of Sarah Rector. We're talking about the same people. This is her grandfather. Remember, he was going by Benjamin, and we know he was going by Rector, too, as John, not as Jack. But now he's Jack, Benjamin Rector. Let's go to the actual record. In findagrave.com, we got Jack Benjamin, and then we got parentheses John, right? So this, again, this is all of the research I had to do and make sure I had the right person. So this is definitely him, as you guys can see. AK, oh, this whole name is not even real. The John or the Jack, you know, that one of them is his name could be Jacob. And I'm going to read to you what it says here. It says, John Rector's father, Benjamin McQueen, was a slave of Riley Grayson, who was a Creek Indian. Oh, really? You know, guys, because when I did this whole genealogy thing, I didn't come up with any of that. I didn't find no slave records of him. Still trying to figure out where they're getting this from. What sources? John Rector's mother, Molly McQueen, was a slave of a Creek leader, Opotole Jahola, who fought in the Seminole Wars and split with the tribe, moving his followers to Kansas. Huh, Johola is supposed to be her slave master, right? But what if this was her father? We know many cases, the so-called slave master, people who do genealogy know what I'm talking about, turns out to be the dad or just a family member that they were under. Yeah, indentured servitude and all that was real. And, you know, apprenticeships and all that. And these people 
or in their family that all, all that happened so he was a seminal who split from the seminal so he became a creek leader after he split with his followers now let me show you guys the inscription on the tomb i want to show you guys son i'm going to close up to it now it says here jack benjamin right soldier from the colored troops right u.s colored troops better known as john rector better known as john rector they're saying his real name is jack benjamin that's not even his real name <laughs> So we're gonna find out that his dad is actually named Benjamin. His dad's first name is Benjamin. So what I'm seeing here is that he took his dad's first name and was using it, I guess, as a surname because they're leaving the McQueen out completely. His dad is Benjamin McQueen. Yeah, Scottish Highlanders. And I don't mean he's specifically a full blood Scottish Highlander. I'm just saying the name, right? We're gonna go over the Highlanders today a little bit as a reminder. So in case you don't think I was reading that correctly, it says here, Jack Benjamin Soldier, U.S. Colored, better known as John Rector. All right, that's him. So trust me, guys, when I do this genealogy thing, I, I try to make sure I'm not just making up things and adding things. It's not always easy. You got to kind of do a lot of investigation, making sure. So again, Jack John McQueen Benjamin Rector. All right, again, so Jack's parents would be Benjamin McQueen and Molly McQueen. Now, all right, so before we continue, I want to bring you to this book right here. This is actually one of the books most quoted as a source, right? Like, there's actually not a lot of information out there on Sarah Rector on purpose. They don't really want you to know about her. I want to point something out here and discover. You see, this is the picture that you would find on the internet. I know people think, oh, there she goes. I know a lot of people see this uh, image of her on the internet and think this is Sarah Rector. Well, I'm going to tell you guys that's a false picture of her. That's not even Sarah Rector. I'm going to prove it to you guys. And I'm going to let her own family, her own family members. Yeah, they're going to do a guest appearance here. Her own family members are going to let you know. I'm not making this up. They wanted to paint this image, this little poor descendant of slaves, girl, so hopeless. First home in Kansas City. And home on 12th Street still stands. She was our city's first black millionaire, but her family members say some of her story told for years isn't completely true. This is Aunt Sister Sarah Rector's uh, obituary. This story you're about to hear. My fondest memory was the farm. Is a whole different animal. She had chickens, cows, calves, and stuff like that. And then geese. So the geese chased us. Yeah. But the <laughs> this flock of sisters <laughs> sat down with me to separate fact from fiction about their aunt. They should know the truth. Yeah. They should know the truth. They should know uh, that all the pictures that's out there of Sarah Rector are not, not her. Sarah Rector. Right. Last week we told. All right. Did you guys just hear that? They said that all these pictures, this one right here, the one you see on the internet everywhere about Sarah Rector, that's not even her. That's not her. False identity. That's not her picture, okay, guys? That's not her. Her own family, her own nieces are telling you that's not their aunt, okay? Just be aware of that. I told you the story of Sarah Rector, the first black millionaire in Kansas City, at the time the youngest millionaire in the country, one of the many descendants of slaves or freedmen born before 1906, given a land allotment in Oklahoma, where a driller hit a gusher on Rector's allotment. And there was also a real danger to freedmen living in the area. Historian Diane Houston says that's a big reason why the Rectors packed up and moved to Kansas City. Sarah's mother, Rose Rector, bought this house on 12th Street. Houston says as soon as the oil was discovered, Rumors and inaccuracy started flowing just as freely. We always know this. You can't always trust everything you read. And then they had had it also that she was an orphan. She was not an orphan. Right. She was not an orphan. Yeah. And said that uh, her father died in prison. And it also had, which is not true. And get this, Houston and Rector's nieces tell me there's a picture of Sarah Rector at the Smithsonian. That's not her. So how come no one said anything? Even when we were kids, my mom and them knew that wasn't her, you know, but never leave it alone. Just let them talk. Rector's nieces say Sarah and her mother and Sarah's husband all lived at this house on 12th Street. And eventually... She had a house on, on, uh... 
Lock Ridge. Rector's family members say she just about bought up the entire block. She also owned a house across the street, an apartment building down the street, and she liked the finer things in life. She lived a life of luxury. She had money coming in, and she did whatever she pleased with it. I remember the fancy cars she had, the big fancy Cadillacs. I remember that. I remember her coming to the house, and they play cards, and they sit around, and they have fun. They would close Emeryburg Fair down, downtown, because we couldn't go in there and try on clothes. Yeah. But they closed it down for her to come and shop. There were many layers to Sarah Rector, and while some of what circulated online is false, she was never an orphan, she wasn't abused or living on a dirt floor, family members well, say what is true, she played hard, and she loved hard. Most of it's like she was a party girl. She loved the party. And she did. But the flip side was she loved her family. All right, Sarah Rector's own niece is letting you know those are fake pictures of her. She was never an orphan. They made up a lot of things. Real quick, we continue in the Washington Post here. It says here, world's richest Negro girl. Inspired media ridicule, fascination, and alarm. Sarah Rector was 11 when oil was discovered on her land in Oklahoma in 1913. Her sudden wealth became the object of racist news coverage. So again, a lot of this stuff, her being poor, her being a slave and all this stuff, they were making a lot of this stuff up. They were being very racist with it. A lot of these newspapers were owned by white supremacists, yeah. This article was written on September 3rd, 2022. Deborah Brown grew up calling her Aunt Sister, and she remembers her storied life through the haze of childhood in segregated Kansas City, Missouri, more than a half a century ago. They were the fancy limos and Cadillacs that ferried young relatives to school and out for barbecue. The white-owned department store that opened its doors just so Sarah Rector could shop. The rolling farmland where Rector would invite Brown's mother and the children for family gatherings. Brown, then a grade schooler living in a two-bedroom house with three siblings, her parents and her grandmother marveled but didn't dare ask questions. We're from a generation where you don't spread family business, said Brown, a very fit looking 72 year old with a short afro seated in the lobby of the Hampton Inn in Bowie, Maryland. Her mother, Rosa Rector, would simply say, Aunt sister can afford to do that, Brown said. That's the way she would put it. She can afford it. She never said she was rich. It wasn't until Brown was in her late teens, after Rector died in 1967 at the age of 65, that Brown realized Aunt Sister had indeed been rich, historically so. For the first time, Brown heard the word oil. The white-owned newspaper, seemingly unconstrained by facts and at times human decency, were openly racist in their coverage. Oil made Pickney Ridge, blared a headline to the Washington Post which described Rector in 1914 as an orphan, crude, black, and uneducated jet worth more than $4 million. All right, so this is the picture they were painting of people. The truth, at the time, Rector was living with both her parents in a two-room cabin. She jet to become a millionaire, crossing that threshold at about 18 with oil earnings that would be worth $14 million today. The sensationalism that dogged Rector in her youth has continued long after her death in a role not unfamiliar to descendants of historical figures. Brown said she finds herself constantly playing a whack-a-mole as journalists and academics replicate earlier errors. A lot of misinformation about Sarah Rector. In the internet era, she said with a sigh, it sometimes seems like a losing battle. And this is what I'm trying to do and help also the family and just show the facts and stay away from all the conjectures and all the made-up stories. The most vexing bit to Brown, the black and white photo of the somber-faced girl with pigtails wearing dark plate dress, it has appeared on the cover of an award-winning book about Rector. That's the book we're reading, right? So how can we trust everything she's saying in there about them being slaves and all that? She didn't even do her due diligence. On the Facebook page of the National Museum of African American History, it's also there, you see that? And culture in Washington and elsewhere. So that's a fake picture of her, and they keep using it. They haven't taken it down. That's the kind of image they want you to portray of Sarah Rector. Although the image can be traced to the 1915 issue of the American magazine, a now defunct white-owned publication, Brown insists it is not her aunt. All right? The American magazine. So I'm going to show you guys exactly what they're talking about, where they got this image from. Where the 
this is the source of this picture where everybody got it from. This is the American magazine from 1915, volume 79. All right, in volume 79 of that year, they did an article on Sarah Rector when they're talking about interesting people. And they put here, Sarah Rector, a little 10-year-old Creek Friedman living in Oklahoma who now has an income of at least 10,000 a month. The discovery of oil raised her from poverty to riches. Here's her two-room house on the prairie. And when you go look into this and the articles, they'll tell you there is no source for their picture, like who gave them the picture. So this is their little article, says here, $10,000 a month for a little Negro girl. One thing I found uh, interesting in their little article, says here, only through a colorful length of history has Sarah's fortune been made possible to Sarah. It is really a story centuries long. Away, back in mystery shrouded years, a dark-skinned tribe, a dark-skinned tribe fled from invaders. On our eastern shores, southward they journeyed and finally entrenched themselves in Florida. Seminoles, they were called then. Seminoles, huh? The runaways. The runaways, Seminoles, because they had separated from their own tribes of Creeks and Muscogees. As years went on, they dominated the people about them. They conquered many and enslaved more. Still later, other Indians and Negroes, so-called Negroes, same people most of the time, slaves and tribal brothers joined them from Alabama and Georgia. And presently, they owned a trick of towns and streams near Tallahassee was their capital. Today in Oklahoma, we know them as one of the five civilized tribes, all right? So they're even admitting these are dark-skinned tribes, huh? They didn't say nothing about them being Africans or ex-slaves, that part, right? So real quick, I just wanted to show you where they get that picture from so you guys can look into it. That's the actual source where they get this picture from, and they made it up. All right, so returning to the Washington Post article. So right here again, they were telling you that that's not her picture. Brown insists it is not her own. Brown's mother insisted too. So obviously she knows her sister, right? She's going to know who her sister is. Rector, round face, looked nothing like the girl with the more angular chin in the picture, said Brown, who first caught sight of the photo online in 2010. We can't prove with absolute certainty to everybody that it's not her, Brown said, because there are no childhood photos that exist for comparison, but it definitely isn't her. So I kind of just wanted to point it out and letting you know that you got to be careful with all the stories you read about her, especially in those old newspapers. Now I'm going to include, you guys got to dodge the hide that with all the slave narratives. You guys got to really start doing genealogy, understanding what was really going on in these so-called slavery times and what really existed, the indentured servitude system and all that, people being stuck in these indentures, becoming chattel, but it wasn't about Kunta Quinta slavery with slaves from Africa. That's a whole false narrative. Focus. So this book is called Searching for Sarah Rector, the Richest Black Girl in America. Again, the richest so-called black girl in America, but she's a Creek Indian, they're calling her black. From the Coretta Scott King honor winner, Tanya Bolden. All right, Tanya, you got an award, but you put a fake picture of Sarah Rector. It says here, Sarah Rector was born on March 3rd, 1902. Her home was a weathered, whipped two-room cabin near the tiny town of Twine, Indian Territory. There, Sarah and her family were known as Creek Freedmen, that is, black members of a nation of Indians commonly called Creeks. Muscogee is what these Indians called themselves. This union of several tribes long included the Yuchi, the Tuskegee, and the tribe whose name the union bore the Muscogee. And a belly flop to this part of the book, huh? they're talking about Opotli Johola. They remember they said that was the slave master of Mali. Sarah Rector's great grandmother. Okay, so Dutch the hijack with the white washing and this drawn, but possibly this could be her dad. Possibly, and there is nothing indicating her parents, so nobody can tell you yes or no. But him being the supposed owner is a possibility that that is her dad. So let's read a little bit about him. It says here, among the more than 20,000 creeks forced west of the Mississippi was the Alabama-born chief, Opotli Joholo. All right, we're going to find out. I'm going to show you guys. That's not even his real name uh, completely. His real surname goes to Cornell. 
he appears to be half European, half Indian. I'm going to show you guys in the genealogy. His slave holdings included Sarah Rector's great-grandma, Molly, who was also born in Alabama. So was her husband, Benjamin, owned by a different Creek man, Riley Grayson, all right? Real quick, I want to go into Benjamin and Molly's records real quick, what I could find. You know, can't find much. This is way back in eight, almost 1700s. Now, I know where they're getting this information from. They're just getting it from this Dosro right here. Now, the people like Benjamin McQueen and John Rector, they're not the ones filling this out. It's people filling this out for them. It says here, name of father. They're talking about John Rector in the previous uh, page. As you guys can see here, John Rector, known as John McQueen in the Dunn Roll. We go to the next page. It says, Father Benjamin McQueen. All right, it says, Father's Tribal Enrollment, Canadian, or from the uh, Canada town in Oklahoma. It says, Father's owner, Riley Grayson. Name of mother, Molly McQueen, and mother's owner, Opotela Hola, all right, the Indian chief. So both of these people are supposed to be Creek Indians, right? Creek Indians. And remember that Opetela Jahola was a Seminole, and most of these people have Seminole ancestry and family too. So if these are Indians, right, the Seminole Indians, Creek Indians, let's not forget what Seminoles look like. We're going to do this real quick, all right? So, Dash the Haya, there goes your Seminoles right here. So, right here on the right, Seminole Warrior. All right, some Seminole females. Yeah, there goes your Seminoles right here, right in the middle. Right here, Billy Bowlegs on the right, Seminole. On the left, we got the Seminole girl and the Iroquois girl, as you guys can see. We got two Seminole Indians on the right, Lucy Pierce and Billy Bowlegs, as you guys can see. Seminole woman here on the right. So what you mean Seminole Indians owning Negroes? These are Seminole Indians. You mean they were owning their family or they just had indentured servants working under them on their farms and stuff? What are you talking about? This is a Seminole woman right here from Evergreen, Florida, 1907. So-called black too. Seminole boy and girl right here all the way in the left. Check it out. Let me zoom into them. All right. Seminoles right here. Black Seminole woman all the way in the right, unidentified. Three Seminole John women right here, the Everglades, Florida. Little Tiger Seminole Indian right here on the right. Seminole women in the middle right here. We got Ingram, Billy, and Stimatli with their grandchildren Seminoles right here. I got Seminole girl from the Everglades, Florida, 1907, right here. Seminole man and son, Everglades, Florida. So we got a Seminole woman. She don't look too happy. <laughs> we got Billy Bolex the third and family members, Seminole Indians, Florida, right here. We got a Seminole woman right here. As you guys can see, who's that? Couple colored tribes of America. We got Seminole girls and Charlie Tommy and Canoe in the Everglades, Florida, right here, 1907. Seminole boy and girl, some more. I think you guys get the idea, right? So you guys kind of understand what I'm trying to show you guys, right? This is a Seminole Indian right here. She was later later raised by Kiowa. All right. I know you guys seen this image on the internet. Let me zoom in. So we're talking about Seminole. Indians owning so-called Negroes. What do you mean? They are so-called Negro. Seminole Negro Indian Scouts right here, 1889. Courtesy of the New York Library's Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture. Deaconess Harriet Mary Bedell with Seminole Indian women and Seminole children. Seminole Indian sitting in his wheelchair, Charlie Dixie Camp, Florida. Seminole Indian. So we're going back to findagrave.com and going back to Jack Benjamin, so-called Jack Benjamin. He's a McQueen, McQueen blood and indigenous blood, McQueen Highlander blood and indigenous blood. Now, remember what it was telling us here that Opatoli Jahola, who fought in the Seminole Wars, split and moved his followers to Kansas. So he was a Seminole, right? We already saw the Seminole, so dodge the hijack. 
when you're picturing white people owning so-called Negroes. You got to break the spell with their stories. So when we're reading things like this, people being owned, that's all conjectures and hijacked. There is no source for this. There is no source for this. These DOS rolls, again, they weren't filled out by the person. I could not find any Riley Grayson historically. I'm still looking. If you guys find anything, let me know. I want to know who he is. I know the Graysons do exist, though, in that area. And historically, I'm just trying to look for Riley Grayson just to be able to confirm this. Now, Opatela Johola, he does have a, a story and a history. You guys can just Google him. But I'm going to show you who he is really is as well. We're going to get to that later. All right. So he supposedly owned Molly, the great grandmother of Sarah Rector. A, a Seminole Indian, right? A Seminole Indian. I just showed you the Seminole Indians, right? And then we're talking about Creek Indians, right? I want to remind you guys of my recent video from two months ago. It says here, Creek Indians, their bones, physical description, and their disfranchisement by Native Americans. What I have here from the historical collections of Georgia. This is a historical drawing. This is not me making things up because... They have whitewashed his image. When you Google Tuste Nugi Imatla, today you get whitewashed images. This is what he looked like. This is Historical Collections of Georgia by George White. Look it up. It's in there. I'm not making this up. He was a full-blooded creek and was born in the Tallapoosa River. A full-blooded creek. That's what they look like. Also in this video, we read from a book early history of the Creek Indians and their neighbors by John Swanton. It says the Spaniards have visited several regions of that vast country. They are called Arambe, Guaycaya, Guajate, Tanzaca, and Pajor. The color of the inhabitants is dark brown, okay? Dark brown. We're talking about Creek Indians, so-called Creek Indians, dark brown, but this is their real names right here. These clans or these tribes, these people. None of them have any system of writing, but they preserve traditions of great antiquity and rhymes and chants. Dancing and physical exercises are held in honor. Rhymes and chants, and they love dancing. They love dancing and physical exercises. And they are passionately fond of all ball games. They like ball games in which they exhibit the greatest skill. All right? Who are they describing here? Good in ball games. They love to rap, <laughs> rhymes and chant, dancing physical exercise and they're dark brown and they're creek indians you already know who they're talking about so when we're talking about creek and seminole slave owners don't be picturing so-called white people and dodge to hijack with their slave narratives because these slave narratives that they told us in school are not correct a lot of the times it's just family a lot of the times it's just indentured servants doing their seven year right this is their apprentice this is what they do when I just want to make sure we're clear. This is a creek right here. All right. Creek Indian. And we saw the Seminoles. So when we go to these books, they're talking about Creek Indian, a Creek man, Riley Grison, a Creek Joholo chief. He's a Seminole, remember? Now, somebody actually put that Molly's dad is chief. Opotole Joholo. Menewa. Cornell's, huh? Cornell's also. Oh, he got a other full name. Now, I didn't see no connection to it, but because she is supposedly working under him and that's, that's supposed to be her slave master, this might be her dad in actuality. So I left it on there, but I do want to show you is his records, though, what I was able to find on him. So I was able to find this. It appears to be. A grave for him says Shiva Potle, Laughing Fox Jehola. Says burial details unknown, specifically on a hill that overlooks Old Fort Belmont in Woodson County, Kansas. Now, you guys thought he was full blood, right? Now, look what it says here. It says, while well, he was a European and Creek ancestry, what Creek? As he was born to a Creek mother, he was fully part of the tribe. Remember, they went by matrilineal descent. He was among the Red Sticks in the Creek War of 1813 and 1814. Huh? He was a Red Stick Creek, but he was half European. And that's okay, guys. I'm not just trying to point him out in, in a negative way. I'm just showing you guys that 
We got to be open mind about what ancestors we may have, even if they were chiefs or Indians in certain tribes, they still might be half black Europeans. We're not talking about white people here. Now in GeneNet.org, they have Opotli Jahola with the same info we just read. And they got the parents, Alexander Oshihajo Cornells. And then we got Liba, big woman. Remember, she, her, the mom is supposed to be a Creek Indian, big woman. And then we got his dad, Alexander Cornells. Remember, he was European. He might be half European too. He also had the title of Oche Hajo, which meant warrior. Hajo became like a surname too. Opotli was the speaker of the Upper Creeks, known as the Muscogee Creek Nation. He fought against Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and as an ally in Jackson's attempt to round up Seminoles who were terrorizing the Florida's settlers. So again, their name in his dad, Alexander Ochihajo Cornells. Now, historically, these are important people, especially amongst the Creek Nation. We're going to get into this in other videos. I just wanted to point out certain things. A lot of this stuff about slavery is all conjecture. They don't have no real records to point out that these people are actually slave masters in the sense. Again, that's most likely her dad. If she was working under him, where is her parents? When did he acquire her? If she is a slave, where did he purchase her from? Who is she? We know no Africans were coming in in 1800s. We know that's a lie anyways, that whole African slave trade. If you're new to my channel, I suggest you catch up. There's a reason why I'm saying that. We've shown the sources, historical facts. This is no doubt. The people they use for manual labor in the Americas were not coming from Africa by the millions. That's a false narrative. So that was something I just wanted to clear up before I proceeded, because this is, again, a lot of conjecture. And again, we got to dodge the hijack with their narratives. We already know they like to lie a lot. They've lied about things in history, that's nothing new. Okay, I'm gonna continue, it says the record is cited on great grandma Molly and great grandpa Benjamin's journey from Alabama. So that's a big one. And that's why I went and showed you guys to have a better perspective because look, they just admitted, they don't have no real records of them before they were relocated. They don't know anything about them before they were relocated. The record is silent on their journey from Alabama, but a snippet of another black couple's experience has survived. So this is a whole other family. Listen to this. This is a whole other people. It has nothing to do with the rectors, the Benjamins, Molly, all these people. It has nothing to do with them, the McQueens. It has nothing to do with them. Again, the record is silent on their journey, their relocation. Where were they coming from? Who were they before they got there? This year, Creeks for the Union, Chief Opotle Joholo was among the Indians in Indian territory who opposed siding with the Confederacy. When the Civil War broke out, he declared neutrality. Like-minded Creeks and other Indians gathered at his 2,000-acre plantation near the Deep Fork River. So did many Blacks after the Chief sent word, promising freedom to all who joined him. He did this in anticipation of attacks by Confederate forces attacks that came all too soon outgunned and outmanned opotli joholo's forces eventually fled to kansas there many joined the pro-union first indian home guard among those in company d was sarah rector's grandpa on her mother's side jork mcgilbra oh who later took the surname jackson oh really all right so sarah rector on her mom's side, right? We go up. We got Rose Jackson. We're still going to get to her real quick. I'm going to show you something. And then George Jackson is her dad and Amy McGilbrey. All right. The McGilbrey. Again, McGilbrey. We got another Highlander clan family. Scottish Highlander name. Jackson as well. Sons of Jacob. Jackson means sons of Jacob. That's what Jackson means. Now that's George Jr. And this is George Jackson senior he is a jackson now they're saying over here that his name is george mcgilbra who later took the surname jackson he didn't take the surname jackson he is a jackson 
he was never a McGilbrey. George Jackson McGilbrey, who should have never been McGilbrey, the junior is what I mean. He was married to a McGilbrey, supposedly, we're going to see again. Again, a lot of these people throwing the names around of their ancestors and switching up throughout their life different last names. I'm going to show you guys. George Jackson Jr., again, he shouldn't be McGilbrey. He married a McGilbrey, so he will come out in certain records, I'm going to show you, as McGilbrey. So here we got George Jackson. It says here in 1890, he's 48 from the game from the Canada town in Oklahoma, Canadian. And right here it says slave of Lincoln McGilbrey. Remember, he married a McGilbrey. So these are all family. These are all family they working under in their farms or wherever they're doing. Now on the next page, it lists his parents supposedly, and they got Jack McGilbrey and they got Jack twice McGilbrey. And then the father supposedly owned by McGilbrey too when he's a McGilbrey. That's all family. And then my name of mother, Rena McGilbrey. But this is all wrong. I'm going to show you guys. So George Jackson Jr.'s wife is Amy Emma McGilbrey. We're going to read about her in that book we're reading. Her parents, her dad is Jack. Her dad is Jack. They put Jack under her husband. They messed up in that census. As you guys can see, she's listed as Emma Jackson here because she's married to George Jackson. He's not a McGilbrey. She's the McGilbrey. Her maiden name is McGilbrey. 1930, she's McGilbrey again. Why? She's widowed. She's not with Jackson anymore. Here, she's living under Sarah Rector, but Sarah's listed under Campbell because she was married to Kenneth Campbell. She's the head of household. And we got Amy McGilbrey, grandmother. So you guys can see that is her grandmother, Amy McGilbrey. Now, under George Jackson, we have Amy, right? The wife. And the next page, I wanted you guys to see they had Jack the same. They had Jack for both of them. So Jack is only Amy, Amy's dad, not George Jackson. Here they have Nancy Colonel as the mom. We're, here we have Amy McGilbrey listed as Creek, 1896. This is a picture of Amy right here. Amy and Rosa. Rosa is Sarah's mom. This is Sarah's mom's young. This is her grandmother, Amy. Okay, remember Creek Indians. Now, what I found interesting in her death certificate, right? I found Amy McGilbra, right? She died in McGill, colored, widowed. What they have heard that is Manuel. You see here, Jack Manuel from Oklahoma and Nancy Unknown, informant Rosa Rector. That's Sarah Rector's mom. So she must have known her grandparents, right? So Rosa put that Jack McGilbrey is actually Jack Manuel. So I found that interesting. Well, that's a whole other thing, story right there. Jack Manuel and McGilbrey. The whole McGilbrey, where is it coming from? Because it seems that he was a manual. I haven't been able to go past Jack Manuel or McGilbrey. And I did find a lot of the kids listed as Manuel. See, Rachel Manuel, there's records under those names. Jim Manuel. So the Manuel name is there. So not sure where the McGilbrey is coming from. And then we got Nancy McGilbrey Jackson or Colonel. You saw their name was coming out as Colonel. We don't even know where that's coming from either. I don't I don't see the Colonel. Again, right here, she's Nancy Colonel. In the Dawes row. Right here, she's as Nancy McGilbrey. Spouse of Jack McGilbrey. And right here, she's listed as Creek. Not sure if they're the same people, but yeah, I think they were. And in 1900 census, Nancy McGilbrey, black. She's living where her kids listed as Manuel. This is what I'm trying to show you guys. Manuel. Who's Manuel? Her husband, Jack Manuel. So where's the McGilbrey coming from? Is it from her? Most likely. That's what I was assuming. So again, they were talking about George Jackson Jr.'s dad. George Jackson would be of age to be fighting in wars in the Civil War because he was born in Tennessee. Haven't been able to go past him. But again, the Jackson, again, another Highlander name. And the mom is Jane Anglin. More. I found that interesting. Can't find much more on her, but I did find some records of her, of them only. And of course, on the other side, we got McQueen. All right. Now, there's another thing I want to point out this whole slave narrative and these false perspectives they give us these conjectures that we go by when it comes to history we go off a lot of conjectures and we don't even know it now we do see a lot of mcqueen 
McGillbreeze, got Jackson, Campbell. So we got a couple of Scottish Highlander families and names here, huh? So they're telling us Benjamin and Molly were slaves. So how did Benjamin become McQueen? If his slave master had a whole different name, what is the background story? What is the background story of Benjamin McQueen and Molly? How did they get this McQueen name? Who is their dad? When were Africans given this last name? Where is the record? Remember, they already told us in that source from that lady who wrote that book with the fake picture that they don't have no record. The records are silent regarding Benjamin and Molly when they were in Alabama. They don't know anything about them. It's all conjecture. That's what I'm trying to tell you guys. McQueen's, right? I was able to find John McQueen. That was what's coming up as his dad and a woman named Chloe and Warrior. All right. That was, I th which I thought was very interesting. Now, now right away I saw Warrior. I was like, that has to be an Indian, you know. But as I want to show you here, surprisingly, Warrior was actually used as a surname in England for a lot of centuries. You know, they say it even goes back all the way to the Saxons, you know, the ancient Saxons future video i'm gonna show you guys who the saxons really were as you guys can see here they got a lion a couple feathers in their head but i just wanted to show you a warrior doesn't necessarily mean that it might be an indigenous person but of course we're talking about 1790 and most likely the women and most of these women that these highlanders are getting with are american indians wasn't able to find her parents yet or anything like that. I looked for her, searched for all that, still uh, digging. Now, let's not forget, just yesterday, guys, I told you the Scottish Highland clans are mostly described as dark-skinned individuals, so-called Negro people, so-called Black. We have several videos, several sources proving that. And when we're doing our genealogy, as I'm showing you guys today, it's starting to go back a lot of the times to... McQueen's, McIntosh, McGillivray's, McDonald's, you know, a lot of the Highland families. You got to break the spell thinking these people were white. So you can't tell me that Benjamin McQueen got his name from a white slave master because the McQueen's, and I want to show you guys here, the McQueen's, right? We're in the Clan Chatan. Who's the Clan Chatan? It's a unique confederation of Highland clans. Na Kat. Kat Nakatanai, Clan Chatan, the Cat Nation, the Cat. Don't mess with the Cat if you don't got a glove on. That's their motto. They might scratch you. Now down here it says clans belonging to Clan Chatan. All right, we got McPhil, McPherson, McIntosh. We know the famous McIntosh with the Creeks, Clan McGillivray, Clan Davidson, the McQueens of Stratton, the McQueens. There you go, the McQueens. And they got other ones right here, other clans. These are all Highlander clans. A lot of most, all these people were described as dark skin. We got the primary sources. We got the historical reference, right? The Cat Nation. So again, Clan McQueen is a Highland Scottish clan and a member of the Chata, Chatan, Chata, Chata, Chatan Confederation. The clan does not currently have a chief and is therefore considered an armigorous clan. The name McQueen is sometimes also given as McSween. You see that with the S, which means son of Swain. The McQueens are allegedly of the same descent as Clan Donald, all right? And Clan MacDonald, they're said to have been the same families, having kingship with the High Kings of Ireland. The High Kings of Ireland. When we're talking about Benjamin McQueen and John McQueen, we got a deep history behind these people. Their ancestors, who are they? They're not just African slaves or Africans. Dodge the hijack. We already know they have plenty of American indigenous blood, but also they're leaving out the black European, the Scottish Highlander blood. I just want to show you something real quick. The Highland clans, as it says here, Alistair Moffat. This is a book, The Highland Clans. And in this book, what I wanted to show you is this map. Shout out to Lee Cummins. He actually scanned this and uh, put it in one of his books. But this is the actual uh, source that it's coming from. And it's showing you that you didn't get all these names from white people. All these right here, most of these are all black folks, black families, black Scottish, indigenous, ancient Scots, Highlanders and all that, 
right here, as you guys can see, Clan Chatan, almost right here in the middle, Clan Chatan next to McIntosh, McDougal, McPherson. We got Stewart, Campbell, McCarthy, Gordon, Forrest, Menzies, Burnett, Keith, Lindsey, Graham, M Murray, McDove, Lindsey, Montgomery, Cunningham, McMillan, McLean, McFy, McInnes, McKinnon, McGilvery, right? McDonald of Glengarry, McDonald, McKinnon, Ross, Clan Ross, Rose, Brody, Ines, Cummins, Keith, Gunn, Oliphant, St. Clair, Morrison, Matheson, Lewis, McAuley, McCloyd, Harris, McAskill, McNeil, all right, and so on. You guys can see, just wanted to show you guys, these are not names you got from slave masters. This is part of your ancestry as well. If you got this surname, this is part of your ancestry. We're just talking about black Scots, brown complexion with black curled hair and dark eyes. Now, on a side note regarding the Highlanders, especially the clan Chatan, their name and how they have the cat, right? I found it very interesting. Now, regarding the Erie Indians, if you guys don't know, the Erie Indians says here, the Erie Indians, they're near the Great Lakes, right? or the Cat Nation, the Cat Nation, were first known in 1624 when the Huron told Father Gabriel Sagard about Iring Ronong or Irike Ronong, living across the lake. Sagard's 1639 Huron Dictionary translates this term as cat people. And then they add their hijack, possibly referring to raccoons. Why would they be talking about raccoons? They're literally telling you cat. These are the Cat Nation. We're just talking about Black Panther, Jaguars, and all that. Yeah, right here, Cat Nation. They, the Iroquois, tell us that the Eries have taken arms against them. We call the Eries the Cat Nation. So even though they supposedly speak an Iroquois dialect or language, a type, they still beefing with the Iroquois. Why are they really Iroquois? So they call the Eries the Cat Nation because there is in their country a prodigious number of wildcats, two or three times as large as our tame cats but having a beautiful and precious fur. As it says here in Wikipedia, the Iri people, or Iri's Nashun du Chat, Nashun du Chat, when you go to Clan Chatan, it's telling you not Kat Nashun. It almost saying like the Cat Nation. The way I'm seeing this, Kat Nashi, the Cat Nation. They got a cat. Could there be an ancient connection here? I really think there is. A lot of those highland, those pigs, a lot of those, again, I believe we're coming from ancient America. This here, the wildcat is considered an icon of the Scottish wilderness and has been used in clan heraldry since the 13th century, right? The pigs venerated the wildcat. The pigs venerated the wildcat. Real quick, remember the Erie Indians are the cat people, the cat nation. There's a lot of wildcats with the cat nation. Again, the pigs venerated the wildcats, having probably named Kiteneth, Land of the Cats, Titaneth, Land of the Cats, after them, Land of the Cats. The chief of the clan Sutherland bears the title Morer Chat, Great Man of the Cats. The Clan Chatan Association, also known as the Clan of Cats, the Clan of Cats, Clan Chatan, also known as the Clan of Cats. Again, the Erie Indians or the Cat Nation or the Clan of Cats or the Tribe of Cats very similar right so the clan of the cats right chatan chatan chata 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 chatan chata and they'll tell you they don't know what the word chakta really comes from chakta they give you suggestions but they tell you in most references that it's it's really unknown it says here editors know chata is derived from chakta so the following information is referring to Chakta Indians, right? Same people, the Chatan. It's just one letter missing, right? Chatan, cat. Cat, this might mean the cat people too. This might mean Jaguar warriors. We're talking about Muscogean. We're talking about Jaguar Mexico. We're talking about Jaguar cat people. Come on. Now, I'm not saying there's a full connection here, but I'm just, hey, I'm just here to make you think. <laughs> But it's a very strong correlation here. We know there is a connection. And let's imagine there was an ancient connection with the Chata, with the Chata and Clan Chatan. Then that would mean 
a lot of these people mixing in with a lot of these Creeks and everything, they're just mixing with ancient relatives. Maybe these Europeans knew what indigenous tribes to hook up with. There was maybe an ancestral remembrance there, something we're going to dig into, something that's very, very possible. All right, so I just wanted to point this out, little things here. These are for future videos. I'm going to get into deeper, all right, all this correlation. You're going to see how real it is. So again, I was just going over that again because we're talking about Benjamin McQueen and McGillivray and all these people supposedly descendants of, of slaves who were owned by the Creeks. We already know Creeks and the Seminoles. These were black folks too. These Europeans that they supposedly get in their names from are black folks too. So a lot of that slave narratives that you grew up listening to, you got to really rethink about and evaluate and break the spells. If you're new to my channel, please catch up to the presentations. We have debunked all those out of Africa theories and a lot of the conjectures they told us, a lot of the false information they taught us in school. And I've done it with primary sources. I've done it with genealogy, anthropology, archaeology, ethnology, philology, and many other ologies. <laughs> So I hope you guys understand what I'm trying to say. Like really, like moving forward from this video, every time you see that descendants of slaves and you've seen all these names, you gotta really think about that. Where's the actual proof other than a DOS roll card that says slave of, they could have just been working for these people. So does your own hijacks and your own beliefs. Let's start getting factual. Let's continue with the video. Searching for Sarah Rector, the richest black girl in America. Now, I thought this picture was really cool when we're talking about old world buildings, right? Look at Muskogee County. It says here Broadway and Main Street, Muskogee, Oklahoma. Look what it used to look like. This is where the Indians were living, Indian territory, huh? Now, I thought this picture was very interesting. If you guys take a look, you know, eventually I'm going to colorize it and add it to my videos. Uh, the colorized pictures because these are creek indians in the car so-called black folks right creek indians now let me read what it says here it says cushion drum right field this is around 1912 15 in the car on the left is bernard bryan bb jones riding shotgun with his brother robert e lee jones the white man in the second car is another brother monford precisely who the indians again who the indians in the car right the indians look at your indians right do you see your indians who the indians are in both cars is a mystery oh they don't know who the indians are huh that's a mystery like sarah they could be the owners of land jones leads for oil drilling hey i'm gonna tell you this guy sign these are the owners of the land and you see these guys they're not their slave masters they're their servants driving them around that's their chauffeur they're driving them around their land. Look, they got oil set up already. Nobody's going to invest in building these things if they didn't know there was oil there already. That's why you got to dodge the hijack with these stories. How do you know they're not just driving them around? These are their servants, huh? This is their land. These unknown Indians. Look at these unknown copper colored Indians. All right, so then they go in the book into the part where they start finding the oil. Says little Sarah will soon be in the Plute class, tooted the Muskogee Times Democrat a few days later. Plute was slang for plutocrat or very wealthy person. The paper reported that Sarah's wells was producing 2,500 barrels of oil, a whopping 105,000 gallons a day, with the price of crude oil about a buck a barrel. That was more than $300 a day for Sarah. Plute indeed, especially when an ice cream soda cost a nickel. If that first oil well kept kicking, and if B.B. Jones struck other gushers on her land, 11-year-old Sarah Rector would be able to afford piles of slatings, clothes, and doodads, not to mention a bigger house for her family. It now numbered eight. She had two more sisters, Lily and Rosa. Sarah wasn't the boss of her money, however. Until she turned 18, she still had to have a guardian. All right, so this whole guardian thing is false. It was um, her mom the whole time. So this is what I mean, because they even tell you right here, they made a lot of things up. It says, items on Sarah and other newspapers sometimes served as slapdash facts and fancy. This black girl was a full-blooded Indian, some papers said. Others incorporated reported that she was an orphan, her father having died in prison, and her mother from the white plague, tuberculosis. 
So again, she wasn't an orphan or nothing like that. They made a lot of things up in the newspapers, just like the whole slavery thing is being made up. So they actually have an example here of an article they wrote where she was supposedly kidnapped and she had disappeared as it says here, richest child of the race, mysteriously disappears. Little Sarah Rector is not in Oklahoma, all right? So they're looking for a white guardian careless. Nobody cares about her. So they're creating this whole hype because they want to go get her and control her money. They want to act like they're going to go help her and put her under her guardianship. You see, the so-called black organizations that even Booker T. Washington got involved in. So it's here. So where was Sarah Rector when the defender was in frenzy, fearing her kidnap, hidden away by T.J. Porter? Nope. Wood away by gold digging German? No. Murdered? No. Thank goodness the defender had been woefully wrong. In April 1914, reported that she was in Oklahoma. After all, okay. So a lot of things were being made up. So a lot of things on the internet that you hear about her is not true. That's why I wanted to point out to you guys. So again, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, got involved because of those stories, supposedly, and they were false stories. Continue says here, by the time Sarah went to Tuskegee in 1914, B.B. Jones had drilled many more wells on her allotment. Come summer 1918, there were 50. Only one had been abandoned. Prairie oil and gas in Kansas-based outfit had the lease by then, having paid $300,000 sign-in bonus. Over the years, boatloads of Sarah's bucks, more than a quarter million was invested in real estate. Most of this money bought farmland, which was then rented out. In the adjoining counties of Muskogee and Wagoner, for example, Sarah owned more than 2,000 acres of Price River bottom land. In the city of Muskogee, Sarah owned a two-story building on South 2nd Street. Upstairs was a 40-odd room boarding house. Downstairs were several stores, including a bakery and a Busy Bee Cafe. The man running this cafe, Harry Corey, soon took over the lease on the boarding house and turned it into the Busy Bee Hotel. All right. On top of the revenue from oil, money lending, and rental property, Sarah had other sources of income interest from U.S. savings bonds, for example, and it all added up. When Sarah turned 18 on March 3rd, 1920, she was worth an estimated $1 million, about $11 million today. Where was this truly plute young lady then? Sarah Recta wasn't living near Taft nor in Tuskegee. She was in Kansas City, Missouri, where her family had relocated a few years earlier. There, the Rectors eventually moved into a home that was a far cry from that weather-whipped two-room cabin in which Sarah began life. This home place was a stately stone house. It became known as the Rector Mansion. It kind of goes in about her lavish life and then, you know, asking why, how she lost money. But this says she did spend some with her husband, all that, but they don't really know that. Most likely it was the depression uh, that we will read on. Uh, it says here, Chancellor of Sarah shared her riches with Kenneth Campbell, whom she married in September 1922, when she was 20 and he was 19. Sarah didn't spend all her days living the high life. She was soon the mother of three boys, Kenneth Jr., Leonard, and Clarence, the last one born in August 1929. Her marriage, however, didn't last. By April 1930, Kenneth Sr. was in Chicago, where he became a city council member years later. As for Sarah, by April 1930, home was no longer the rector mansion, but a modest house at 2440 Brooklyn Avenue. Living with her and her sons were her sister, Rebecca, who worked as a housekeeper. All right, her sister, Rebecca, who worked as a housekeeper. They had her. She had her own sister working for her as a housekeeper. And they also lived with their mother's mother, Amy, all right? Amy McGilbrey. We saw what she looked like. That's their grandmother. Sarah Mothers Rose lived not far away on Wabash Avenue with the rest of her children, Joe Jr., who was now 24 and was a truck driver. Lou Alice, 21, worked in a hat shop. Alvin, 20, was a chauffeur. And Lily, 18, who would die of tuberculosis before year's end, was still in school, all right? There's no reason none of these people could have enjoyed a good life and shared in the wealth. She made enough. Not sure what happened, right? Presumably so were the rest of Sarah's siblings, Rosa, 16, Arthur, 14, born in Oklahoma, and Roy, 11, born in Missouri. Sarah's father had died in July 1922, a few months before she married Kenneth. Sarah married again in 1934 to William Crawford, who owned a restaurant, and with him she lived the rest of her days. Sarah Rector Campbell Crawford died July 22nd, 1967, following a stroke. A few days later, she was buried a few miles from her first home place in Taft's Blackjack Cemetery. Was she plute when she passed? No, but neither was Sarah a pauper. She still had some property in Missouri, for example. As for her real estate in Oklahoma, most of it not all, 
of it was gone through sale or foreclosure by 1933, right? The Great Depression. Gone too by then was her allotment. Sarah sold those acres in November 1932 to a Herman Einstein for $100 and other valuable considerations. At the time, more than a dozen of her wells had been abandoned and others would be in years to come, but not all. There were wells in operation in the 21st century. They still were making money and she sold it for a hundred bucks. Over the years, folks have speculated about what happened to Sarah Rector's riches. Did she live too lavishly? Was she mooshed on by dodgy friends? It could be that during the roaring 20s, Sarah, like thousands of other people, bought overhyped stocks and made other bad investments, then suffered big losses in the 1929 stock market crash, tripwire for the Great Depression. The search continues for more information on the person who wants ballyhooed on the richest black girl in America. No easy task. As an adult, she no longer hid under the bed to escape unwanted attention. But as her son Clarence told the reporter in 1990, Sarah Rector was a very private person. Now, I want to talk about something that was uh, recorded in one newspaper that could possibly be true, which is very controversial. And it goes to show you that a lot of the time when they're talking about white and black, it's all about status. It says here, black history, Sarah Rector declared white because she was too rich to be black. Huh? All right. Again, Dr. Hajjah with the fake picture. So apparently Sarah Rector was too rich to be black. Interesting. Got another article here, originalnewsbreak.com. Sarah Rector, the black girl registered as white because of her wealth. Sarah Rector, a black girl, stashed a hijack, was so rich that Oklahoma legislature declared her a white person. Sarah lived in a time when white Americans were terrified of the idea of black person becoming rich and having power. Well, actually, that's still going on today. Right, guys? We're here in the African, stashed the hijack, Native American genealogy blog. It says here, remember Sarah Rector, Creek freed woman and again they got the fake picture so you already know they don't do full research so as much attention was given to sarah in the press in 1913 there was an effort to have her declared white so that because of her millions she could ride in first class car on the trains these two snippets of an article appeared in the chicago defender about her brown skin colored girl made white it says here oklahoma which passed a law declaring all indians white they passed the law saying what? The Indians? What Indians? Even if they were dark skinned, it doesn't matter. They were calling them what? White is about to make an Afro American young lady the same hue on account of her millions. All right, it's all about status. She will be given special privilege to ride across the state in Pullman car, where it is denied others of her race. White people alarmed. The white people have become so alarmed at the enormous wealth of this young girl that they do not like such wealth belonging to a girl of Afro-American blood. Some of the whites want to enamel her, others to use skin success so that she might pass. But the politicians are becoming so stirred up that they, and they, and it says making her white, so they're making her white by passing a law to the effect. If so, it will be the first time a brown-skinned girl has been made white by law. And that's not true. You guys already know we found numerous examples of that. With all the traits and characteristics of an Afro-American, she has too much money and must be white. It's the same old idea of the white man that whenever a Negro achieves any distinction, either in the scientific or literary world, some white men want to declare them white. You hear that? I told you. And like I said, there's been many examples of this. It's something common. When Frederick Douglass began to show his master's ability as an orator and great statesman, white people wanted to claim him. All right. So they go on and on about Booker T. Washington. Yeah, they were calling them white. <laughs> so the source of this, so you guys can know, uh, is it's from the Chicago Defender. This is actually a black owned newspaper from Chicago. This was written in November 15th, 1913. You can actually find this if you're supposedly in an institution like a college or anything like that and have access to this in ProQuest historical newspapers. All right. This is this is the website right here, ProQuest.com and Chicago Defender. And they're going to ask you to log into your institution. I don't I'm not part of any universities. I couldn't access it, but supposedly it's in there. That's what they say. So, yeah, it seems like a brown skin colored girl was made white it was all about status 
real quick, I'm in the Martin City in South Kentucky, uh, the Telegraph. Who was the real Sarah Rector? The richest black girl in America. For a hundred years, these photos have depicted Sarah Rector, the richest black girl in America. But her relatives say those images are fake. These photos are commonly used when telling the story of Sarah Rector. However, her descendants claim these are not her. Again, these two pictures that circulate on the internet, those are not Sarah Rector. You guys gotta stop using it for Sarah. Rectifying Sarah Rector, the richest black girl in America and her family by Diane Houston. The two photos side by side, one of a child in a plaid dress and the other of a woman with her hair pulled simply back have been timelessly interpreted to be the richest black girl in America. Sarah Rector, the very same Sarah Rector who lived out the majority of her life in Kansas City. I have some important news to share with all of America. Those images are not Sarah Rector. Just over a century ago, a headline spilled across America and the world in our misrepresentations along with the photos of what really happened to Sarah Rector, her money and her family. The most important part of this saga is the simple fact that her family got lost within the tabloids. Tabloids worldwide that painted a picture of a poor little black girl from Oklahoma who slept on dirt floors, struck it rich, was taken advantage of, and lived frivolously. All right. So again, I just want you guys to see how many different people, the articles telling you in their own family, letting you know that a lot of their stories about her being poor, all this other stuff. You gotta really be careful what you read about her. Her family's letting you know a lot of that stuff is false. Some of them are partially true, it says here, but the true story of Sarah should be told through her family. I was lucky that a line of rector Sarah's nieces were willing to talk to me and share their stories. All right, so they go over the information that they heard from their parents, you know, things we already kind of went over. This is the house they moved to when they moved to Kansas City, Missouri. This is what they were calling the Sarah Rector Mansion. So here, the move to Kansas City. By the time Sarah was 18, she was worth well over $1 million. Likely in order to escape scrutiny and not wanting to be the target of some greedy parties act, Sarah's family secretly slipped away and moved north to Kansas City. By 1917, Mama Rose, all right, we're going to see Mama Rose's picture and her genealogy, as her family called her, was in charge of Sarah's money until she was able to get control at the age of 20. Okay, this is her family telling you. Mama Rose was the real person in charge of the money until she was 20. It wasn't a bunch of white men and guardians that were stealing her money. They, they exaggerated a little bit with the white people who were involved with this, right? By 1920, the Rector family was living in a beautiful brick mansion at 2000 East 12th Street. That was purchased by Mama Rose for twenty thousand from Henry S. Ferguson, president of the U.S. Water and Steam Supply Company. He had lived in the home for over seventeen years. Today, people refer to the house inaccurately as the Sarah Rector Mansion. When the truth is, her mother purchased it, and her whole family lived there. All right, it was more actually her mom's home at first. The entire frontage of Twelfth Street, from Euclid to Garfield, was bought by Rector, money, and rented out to people for additional income. The family resided in this home until shortly after the stock market crash, where it was then purchased by the Atkins Funeral Home. And this is a picture of Mama Rose. I'm going to show you a colorized version of this. They're saying this is inside the Rector Mansion that we just saw. Living a million dollar lifestyle, the ladies loved finer clothing, but being African American, they were not allowed to shop alongside white patrons in stores on Petticoat Lane. Many stores, including Emory, Bird, Dyer, and Company, would close down and allow the rector women to shop freely. Sarah married her first husband, Kenneth Campbell, in 1920. He focused on real estate development and his car dealership at 18th and Vine. And I think I read somewhere that her husband was one of the first to have a black-owned dealership. It says she had three boys. Sarah and her mother were known for their fancy Cadillacs. Lincoln's and Rolls Royce limo they raced around town. In fact, both women appeared to have a bit of a lead foot. Several speeding tickets were issued to both of them, especially to Sarah. When she was pulled over in her shiny green black Cadillac, Sarah would cockily turn to the officer and say, Don't you know who I am? 
After the stock market crash, a major dent was put into the finances of the Rector family, right? You see the Great Depression and all that. To be clear, Sarah still had quite a bit of money, but she didn't have the ability to throw money around like she had once. Her siblings all took on jobs. Her mother, even for a time, went back to working as a maid. Hmm. Most of the fancy parties that Sarah had, where celebrities such as Duke Ellington would attend, weren't at the Rector Mansion. They were at her home at 2600 Lockridge, where she had purchased several homes on the block. She married her second husband, William Crawford, and lived a relatively quiet life. Mama Rose died in 1957, and Sarah passed in 1967 from a cerebral hemorrhage. Ironically, her body was brought to C.K. Kerford Funeral Home, all right? Her last stop in Kansas City was none other than the old Rector Mansion. Wow. Now a funeral home. Her final resting place in the ground was back where the story begins in Taft and a peaceful parcel of land known as Blackjack Cemetery. All right. That was, um, you know, Sarah Rector's life right there. This is a picture of her. Show you guys a colorized version as well. This is Rose Jackson's entry right here. And I just want to show you a colorized version of that other picture of Mama Rose. This is Sarah Rector's mom in her mansion, what they were calling the mansion in Kansas City, Missouri. Look at her furniture. Look at the nice clothing. Nice stuff here. Fancy stuff. Wasn't nobody taking advantage of Sarah Rector. She was the one in control right here, mostly. And this is Sarah Rector right here. Colorized picture of her, as you guys can see. With, I believe, one of the nieces or a nephew. Again, Rose Jackson and Joseph, her husband, the parents of Sarah Rector. We did go over her parents, uh, Jork and Amy McGilby. Remember, Amy was living there with Sarah. She met her. McGilby, remember McGilby, that's a Highland clan, Jackson. His dad was the one fighting with Opeti Johola with the Union. You guys remember that? I just want to show you this 1900 census. Rose Jackson, born in Indian Territory, says here, so-called black daughter of George Jackson and Emma Jackson. So I just wanted to show you guys that that is her parents. These are her siblings. She is a Jackson. All right, Jackson, Irish, Scottish, English. It says here, distinguished surname, which first emerged in the borderlands between England and Scotland. The name is related to the person named Jack. Jack actually goes to Jacob, if you guys don't know, a pet form of the popular John. All right, so Jack and John could be the same thing, meaning God has favored. All right, Jacob, remember? God has favored and refers to a son of Jack, the son of Jacob. That's what literally Jackson means, the sons of Jacob. So I go into her dad right here, uh, George Jackson McGilbrey, they called him at times, but he wasn't even a McGilbrey uh, Jr. I'm going to show you right here. He's listed as a uh, Canadian colored, but that was a town. And he's on the Muscogee Native American tribe. Okay. Again, Rose's mom. We saw her earlier. We got Amy McGilbrey, right? McGilbrey. That's a Highland clan surname, and she's listed as a Creek here, Native American tribe Creek. So we went over this earlier. I wasn't able to get past any of these people right here, her great grandparents, but you know, it's conjecture saying any of these people are Africans or that they were only slaves. One quick thing regarding Sarah Rector's husband, Kenneth Campbell, he had eventually moved to Chicago and he became some kind of politician in Chicago. Now, this is the father of Kenneth. So when I was doing Kenneth's genealogy a little bit, not a lot, I found out that he took on his mom's name, Kenneth Campbell. So something real quick I want to show you about uh, Kenneth's dad, Pickney Permanis Evans, going to go to his 1880 census. He is listed as mulatto, right? Here he is right here, and this is the whole family. I do want to show you that his mom, Mary, is being listed as white, right? Now we go to the 1900 census, right? 10 years later, how things changed so much in 10 years, right? So first of all, they got his mom, Mary, and him, Pigney, you see his son. Both of them are black now. So she went from white to black, and he went from mulatto to black. This is something very common you find when you're doing genealogy. It might confuse you a bit, but this is what they were doing all the time. When they had his parents, Simpson Evans and Mary Sarah Childress, on his father, Simpson Evans, I did find him being a Chocta by blood. So there's indigenous blood on her husband's side too. So when it comes to the children of Sarah Rector and Kenneth Campbell, they're very indigenous in many ways. They have a lot of indigenous blood, right? 
But everybody wants to say these are all Africans, right? Descendants of African slaves. And that's not accurate at all. So I got future videos coming up regarding what I find here, uh, especially when it comes to the uh, Creek and the chiefs and the historical Highlanders who were mixing with indigenous women. We're going to get more in depth with that in future videos. But this is the genealogy of Sarah Rector. What I'm able to find without adding any conjectures or false narratives. And we're looking at things logically. I hope you guys understand why Sarah Rector's example, her genealogy, her life story. It's something to teach you that you always got to verify all the information. Not sure if it made all sense to you guys. I hope it did. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, the presentation. This has been the real story of Sarah Rector. Yeah, the real one. A more historical one and logical one. Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in once again. Pura vida, mi gente. How oh, wow. wow. Bye.